Does anybody need an outline tonight? Just a few minutes ago, I got actual lead by Watson. He came in holding his little giraffe. I said, I like your camel. He said, actually, it's a giraffe. And then I got asked by a couple people what I was whining about. And I said, well, I don't know if I'm going to rant tonight or whine tonight. The billboard says I'm whining, so I guess I'll whine tonight. <laughs> Good to see everybody tonight. We're going to finish the book of Genesis this evening. And uh, I think I have the clicker situation rectified. So I'm going to, put, I'm going to leave that up there for a little bit. We're going to look at a few things here, a few pictures. So Genesis 49 is Jacob blessing his children. It's not the division of the land. That doesn't occur until the days of Joshua, the latter part of the book of <clears throat> Joshua. But Jacob is about to die, and so he is going to bless his children, as was customary in this particular culture. We're not going to read all of the verses. We, we are going to stop particularly with Judah and Joseph and spend some time on what Jacob says about them. But verses, chapter 49, verses 3 and 4, Reuben. Of course, Reuben is the firstborn by Leah, and that's recorded in chapter 29. And one of the things that's said about him, it's kind of interesting. He acknowledges, okay, you're my firstborn, the beginning of my strength. And that's talking about him as a patriarch. You're, Reuben was the beginning of my strength and the excellence of dignity. And, you know, you were supposed to be way up here, but you are un, as unstable as water. And, of course, that's tied in with what he did, uh, committed adultery slash incest with Bilhah. And that's why he lost his birthright and why he would later be subdued as a tribe. Um, one of the things that we read later on about the tribe of Reuben is that they failed to fight with Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges. You know, one of the things was, and I, I know we're jumping ahead to the division of the land, but when the land was divided, you can see up here on the map, on the, on the right-hand side of the Jordan River, you've got... Um, three tribes. You've got Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And, and as you can see, Manasseh has two very large pieces of land. It's a very big tribe. But when they did that, there were accusations made of them forsaking the other ten tribes. And there was quite, a, quite an uproar about that. But they just needed more land. And so one of the I don't know if you'd say agreements, arrangements, whatever the case may be, but one of those things about the division of the land is when, when one tribe goes to battle, we all go to battle. And so, well, they failed to do that. It's kind of interesting that Reuben himself is referred to as unstable as water. And I, that makes me think, can you think of another Bible verse that says something about being uh, unstable? One, one that I think of, it's in James and it does, some versions use the word unstable, but it says a double-minded man is unstable, the King James says, in all his ways. You know, we have to be singularly focused. And, well, obviously Reuben wasn't. He had some issues. And, and in the future, the tribe of Reuben would have some, some troubles. The, the book of Judges, I tell you, I've got, I've got that reference there. And then a couple of references to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua doesn't really cover all that much time, 20 to 30 years maybe. The book of Judges covers about 400 years of Israelite history, and it's the Dark Ages. I mean, it's, you know, we've, stud we've looked at some stuff in the book of Genesis that's pretty dark. But, man, judge the days of the Judges is depravity among the tribes. Idolatry, murder, I mean, just all kinds of what you might call craziness. All right, so that's Reuben. Simeon and Levi are grouped together, and I think for a reason. It has to do with their cruelty. And uh, instruments of cruelty is what he calls them, refers to them as in verse 5. Well, that has to do with Shechem back in chapter 34. Uh, the Shechemites, a man from that tribe, assaulted their sister. They essentially, um, I guess you could use the word tricked, there was going to be a, a marriage between Dinah and Shechem. But they said, the only way we're going to do that is if all of your men, if 
follow our custom and, and be circumcised. Well, they all agreed to it because they wanted this marriage to happen. And well, after that procedure, uh, Simeon and Levi went in and killed all the males. So instruments of cruelty. And again, that's recorded in Genesis chapter 34. They were divided and scattered, it says there in verse 5. And, uh, or verse 7 rather, 5 through 7, it's verse 7. Levi didn't receive a portion of land. He got, he received, well, they, the tribe, received 48 cities and, of course, the priesthood, 48 cities around in, in different tribes. And Simeon was later absorbed into the nation of Judah or the tribe of Judah. You can see their boundaries are inside the boundaries of Judah. And so you, you see that occurring. Again, you see the laying out of the land in the book of Joshua and then what happens as that process evolves, let's say, or develops throughout the book of Judges, well, Simeon eventually is absorbed into Judah. Okay, any questions or comments on those first couple? Verse 3, blessings. Blessings. I don't know if blessing is the right word. My Bible has this title, Jacob's... Uh, one Bible has Jacob blesses his children. This particular Bible says Jacob's last words. That's probably better than... Because that's not exactly a blessing... You're going to be cursed. The anger is going to be cursed, and they're going to be scattered. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, some of that stuff we don't have any record of. It's something that they did at some point in their life. Yeah, uh, could be. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, there are some... That's one of the interesting things about studying the, the various texts and the textual variants that are there. We're going we're gonna to look at another one with Judah. Uh, there's a pretty interesting difference between what the King James says and what the New King James, and I had never really dug into that until I started putting this particular outline together. It's kind of an interesting thing, so there are some textual variants that we see sometimes, and some of it has to do with newer discoveries in the, in the manuscripts that have been found over time, so just interesting. All right, Judah, verses 8 through 12. I want us to spend some time here. Let's look at it. Judah, Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. So again, this is looking <clears throat> into the future. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. They, in, in time, they became the dominant tribe. And obviously, at the death of Solomon, you have northern Israel and southern Israel known as Judah. And... Uh, they, again, Simeon was absorbed into them, and they be, it essentially became tribes by those names, Israel or Ephraim, and then Judah. Judah is a lion's whelp, okay, a, a pup. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, whom shall rouse, who shall rouse him up? Interesting language, that's not... We wouldn't bless our children like that today. What is that talking about? It's identifying his strength. He's as strong as a lion going after its prey. That's the idea here. The, the prosperity of Judah. Uh, again, 1 Chronicles. I tell you what, somebody turn over there. 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and read verse 2. But he's portrayed as a strong and courageous animal. And uh, how many of you have ever seen The Wizard of Oz? And you've got the cow Isn't it the cowardly lion? Yeah. Well, lion's supposed to be strong and courageous, and that's how Judah is portrayed. Who's got First Chronicles five two for us? Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph. Okay, Judah became ruler. Uh, so that's being prophesied here, but it goes further than just than just looking into the tribal situation. And that's where verse 10 starts. 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him, the King James says, unto him shall be the gathering of the people. And that's, this is one of these differences I want you to listen to. I'll read it from the New King James. It, it's all the same except there at the end. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So, as I was putting this together this week, I looked at, I've got several different Hebrew dictionaries and things like this, and it's, the word is obedience. It's what the word is. I, so, gathering, I don't know, perhaps it's the idea of everybody coming to and submitting themselves to him, but it's a feminine noun in the Hebrew that means obedience. And so, to him, to Shiloh, shall be the gathering of the people, the obedience of the people. Well, what does that mean? So a couple words here, of course, a scepter is indicative of authority, kingliness. Um, he's a lawgiver. He's one who decrees things. And then Shiloh is interesting because if in the two Bibles I've got up here, it's both capitalized as if it were a proper noun. But that's, that's another, what that is, if you looked at it in the Hebrew language, you would see S-I-L-O. So they pulled the Hebrew letters, and they turned it into an English word. And I've told you that there are many words in your Bible like that. Baptism, angel, a lot of words that are like that. But the word itself, Shiloh, the Hebrew word means, um, and I put it here, he whose it is. So let's, let's read it that way. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until he whose it is comes. Until he whose the scepter is. The, 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 whoever this is talking about, it's, it's going to be fulfilled in him. And to him, the one, who's the, scepter belong, the one who the scepter belongs to, people are going to obey him. And so we need to look at some verses here. You got, did you have a question? Yeah, it's a. No, that's it's right. It, what that is, that's not a definition. That's just a. It's referring to the messianic nature of this prophecy. It's Shiloh, as we see it in our English versions. He whose it is is a reference to the Christ who comes from the tribe of Judah. That's correct. So, uh, the one who comes from Judah will have a scepter. He's going to be a king, and he's going to be a lawgiver, and the people will gather unto him. Um, let's go, this is not in your outline, but turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2, interesting passage here. You notice where this psalm starts. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers come together against the Lord's anointed. This second psalm is quoted in Acts chapter 4, and the apostles who are quoting it apply it to the heathen raging, to the persecution against the early church. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? They've, they've exalted themselves against the Lord's Christ. Okay, so we know who this is now, who Psalm 2 is talking about. We know who Genesis 49 verses 8 through 12 is talking about about the Messiah. But then it says here, uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That's quoted in Acts chapter 13 and applied to Jesus. So you've got multiple quotes in the New Testament of Psalm 2, and they always apply it to Christ. Um, look at the end of verse 8. The ends of the earth for your possession. You're going to break the a rod of iron, you shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. It's talking about the reign of Christ, the power, the authority of Christ. And so uh, Psalm 2 is, like I said, quoted in Acts 4. It's quoted in Acts 13. It talks about the, the universality of Christ's reign. And when we're looking here in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12, the scepter, the king, the lawgiver, he whose it is, the people are going to come to Him. They're going to obey Him. And it's interesting, so who, who is it that we say wrote the book of Genesis? 
Who's the author of Genesis? Moses, okay? In fact, we take him to be the, the author of all the Pentateuch, all five books, first five books of the Old Testament. Well, you get to Deuteronomy chapter 18, and Moses begins prophesying about this prophet. Who, he says that God will raise up from among your brethren. He's going to be a prophet like unto me, but you're going to heed his voice. You're going to listen to him. So you have multiple prophecies from Genesis to Deuteronomy that are in reference to Christ. And that's this prophecy, this blessing, if you will, from Jacob to his son Judah, who, of course, becomes the tribe of Judah. I've got a couple verses in here. Um, Hebrews 7.14, Christ came from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Revelation 5.5, 5, he's called the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because of Genesis 49.9. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's the king, he's the lawgiver, and those who will obey God gather to him. Those next two verses there, verses 11 and 12, um, is language that is used a few times in your Old Testament, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. It's talking about prosperity. Like in the days of Solomon, I can't remember the verse, but it talks about the prosperity of Solomon's day, and it says, every man was under his vine and under his fig tree. There was plenty of everything in the days of Solomon. So that's, you see that language in the, a few times in the Old Testament, talking about a time of prosperity. Any questions on Judah? <clears throat> All right, it just, it goes on. It, to me, there's not a lot of comment to make. Uh, Genesis 49, 13, Zebulun. The borders of their tribe are set out there in Joshua 19, verses 10 to 16, because it says, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. It's going to be a haven for ships. His border shall adjoin Sidon. So if you look up here, um, they're right in this area, uh, right on the seacoast, Tyre and Sidon. They're going to be right there. And as such, they would prosper. That's a main trade route throughout biblical times. Issachar, verses 14 and 15 pretty short, and again, I don't know that I would call this a blessing, but he is pictured as a servant. He's going to become a, known for slavery. The, uh, as I put in your outline, this tribe was destined to slavery by this blessing or by this pronouncement, let's say. Uh, Dan, represented as strong and snake-like. You can read Judges 18. Judges 18 shows their I guess you would say their complete departure. They, they officially introduced idolatry to the 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel during the days of the judges. There was a man, uh, I can't remember where he was from. But anyway, he, he hired a man to be his own priest. Micah was his name. He hired a man to be his own priest, and well, the, the tribe of Dan just took right up with that and, and brought uh, idolatry into Israel. Gad is pictured as a warrior tribe. You can read about it in 1 Chronicles 5, 18, 12, 8. Uh, Asher, their location, made them very wealthy. Again, it's right up here by Zebulun, right on the seacoast. And so that would be a natural trade route. Naphtali. The only thing we read about Naphtali in Scripture is that uh, Barak was from that tribe, Judges chapters 4 and 5. Joseph, verses 22 to 26. Joseph, it's interesting as you read those verses, he is pictured as both wealthy and troubled. So verse 22, for instance, he's a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well. So again, the idea of prosperity. But the archers have shot him sorely. They've grieved him and hated him. So again, it's a, it's a mixture, you, you might say, of blessing and, and cursing. But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. And that, you can't help but see that starting in Genesis 39 when he is falsely accused, falsely arrested, thrown into prison. And, and how many times do we read, whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper uh, because of the way that he conducted himself. So his blessings would be realized ultimately, of course, with Ephraim and Manasseh. You remember, Jacob adopted them as his own, and they became two of the 12 tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and I've, I've shared this, I don't know if it was last week or a couple weeks ago, but Ephraim would be 
become representative of the ten northern tribes. You would, again, you read through your prophets, particularly Jeremiah, and the, the northern ten tribes uh, from basically from this line upward becomes known as either Ephraim or Israel. And Judah, of course, would be the southern tribes. Uh, the primary manifestation of this is presented as Israel versus Judah throughout the prophets. You've got the kings of Israel, and you've got the kings of Judah. Um, just thinking of the kings of Israel, one that you, that you would you know, click immediately probably, Ahab and Jezebel, he was king of Israel. Judah had a bunch of good and faithful kings, well, a bunch, they had eight that were considered good, eight of their 21 or 22 but anyway, Ephraim and Manasseh. Benjamin. Benjamin is known for Ehud, the second of the 15 judges of Israel. And Saul, first king of Israel, was from the tribe of Benjamin. Well, then Jacob dies. He blesses his children, or, or again, he gives his last words to his children. And then he dies, and he's buried in the field that was purchased to bury Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. So, just a bit of history there. No, I mean, I'm sure somebody does. I don't. Yeah. No. You talking about the promised land in general? Yeah, from north to south? I want to say, I'm sorry? Yeah. Square mileage. I heard one... A number that I remember, and it, it includes the um, Gad and Reuben and the, and the half tribe of Manasseh on the eastern side of Jordan River, including all of that was something like 6,600 square miles. But I could be wrong about that. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I've, I've got no idea. I have some maps that it has the biblical map like that, and then it has a modern-day overlay, but I don't know off the top of my head what it would be now. It's not anything like this, that's for sure. Yeah, they're going to fight until the Lord comes back. Yeah, there's not going to be any peace in that part of the world, ever. That's, and to me, and that's interesting because we're finishing the book of Genesis, that's connected with Ishmael. His hand is going to be against every man, and every man's hand against him. I, I think that's, I think what we see constantly, I think it's, that's what it's talking about in the book of Genesis. All right. Jacob doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wants to go home and be buried with his family. And then you notice the end of the very last phrase of verse of chapter 49, he was gathered to his people. And that's that concept that we see a few times in the Old Testament of a at death. There is a reunion for those who die in faith. Because we know that Jacob died in faith. Hebrews 11 tells us that. That's just an interesting phrase. He was gathered to his people. All right. Any questions or comments on chapter 49? Chapter 50, verses 1 to 14, is just, obviously, it's a continue continuation of the narrative, but the, it's the embalming and burial of Jacob. And this is an interesting, so I don't know, I know several of you liked the articles that I shared in our group on the mummification process. That's some of the most interesting stuff to watch, like on Nat Geo, the Valley of the Kings. I don't know how many of you have seen documentaries on that kind of stuff, the pyramids and everything that they've been discovered, but the mummification process is quite amazing. Um, it, I, again, I don't know how many of you read the articles, but essentially a person dies, they, they have a hook that they would stick up the nostril, pull out the brain or as much as the brain as they could scrape out and cut them open, remove all the internal organs, 
And they would have jars for the organs because in the afterlife you're going to need those. They would fill the body with a very particular type of salt to dehydrate the body, and then they'd wrap it and wrap it and wrap it. And so I've got several photos up here of mummies that are anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 years old. And the, the preservation is amazing. Uh, and yes, the dry climate. Well, that's like the uh, 1947, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Valley of Qumran. Yes, they're, they're preserved in clay jars. And I mean, they're very delicate, but they are very well preserved too. It's just amazing that these things are found in um, the condition that the bodies are in. Being, again, 3,000 years old. And uh, you can, I mean, you, I don't know how... Well, you can't see it, but the hair is even on top of the head. That's just amazing to me. There's a, there's a high infant mortality rate. Something interesting to think about. And there, that one, I know it's hard to see, but that's hair. This, whoever this was had red hair. And it's just amazing, you know, the ear and the, the eyelids and... It's kind of, to me, it kind of blows your mind to see how advanced that society was and what we can still find there today. All right. Any questions or comments on any of this so far? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, they knew what they were doing, but I wonder how long it took them to, you know, it's a fine science. You don't just stumble upon that. They had to refine it, no doubt. Hundred and seventy times forty. What is that? It's a big number. Do it. About six thousand. Yeah. That seemed like that was a number I remember, like sixty six and that was that was under Solomon, which under Solomon, it went, it, it went even further south into uh, getting down towards Arabia, too. So that's a pretty big piece of land. All right, so again, chapter 50, verses 1 to 14, you have the embalming and burial of Jacob. Well, now it's just Joseph and his brothers. I mean, this is the perfect time for Joseph to strike. And that's what they think, isn't it? Our dad's dead. What's he going to do now? We're in his land. We're at his mercy. Um, they fell down before his face. That's like the third time we've read that, isn't it? And you go all the way back to uh, chapter 37 when he's 17 years old, and he said, hey, guys, I've had some dreams about... And they're like, yeah, we're going to kill you. <laughs> well, and, and here it's all coming to pass. We be thy servants. And if there's an opportunity to get revenge. This is it, man. This is, you couldn't script it any better for this if Joseph were a bitter and vindictive person, could you? This is it. But what's his message there? Somebody read verse 19. The whole verse. Who, who did that? Oh. Am I in the place of God? And that's a perfect commentary. The, what happens here, again, after Jacob's death, that's not, we can't discount that in this particular context, is a perfect commentary on Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Let's turn over there just real quick. We, I was looking at the clock. We'll be all right. Romans chapter 12. How tempting is it sometimes to want to strike back in kind and get even and then justify that behavior? I'd say that's probably a common temptation for all of us to some extent. Repay no man. This is Romans 12, 17. <coughs> <coughs> hmm. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for things good, for good things in the sight of all men. I love verse 18, 
I've been asked this many times over the years, maybe one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Because there are three things you should never forget. If it is possible, what does that mean? Sometimes it's not. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, you know that's personal responsibility, be at peace with all men. And some people don't want peace. If it's possible, as much as you can do, be at peace with people. And you know, some people like turmoil, some people like the fight. There are, some, there are just some evil and bitter people in the world. But this is talking about the church. That can, there can be people like that in the church who are bitter and resentful and just not Christ-like at all. If it as much as depends on you, from your end of it, you have to be at peace with people. If there's a problem in the church, don't let it be because you are the instigator of it. Don't avenge yourselves. Give place to wrath. Because vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That's a proverbial statement. It's actually from the Proverbs. Um, it's a metaphor for remorse. You treat your enemy right, and perhaps, if, if it's possible, and if they want peace, perhaps they'll become remorseful and change their ways. Sometimes that's not possible, though. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that passage? All right, let's go back to Genesis 50 and <clears throat> finish this up. How many times did, his, did he dream his brothers would bow to him? Uh, there were two dreams specifically, right? That his brothers would bow to him? Genesis 37? Yeah, somebody says on the live stream, some people just like to keep the pot stirred. All right, so I'm not in the place of God, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save many people alive. So how many people came with Jacob to Egypt? Do you guys remember that number? About 70? Okay, well, that's a lot of people. But you turn the page to Exodus chapter 1, and we don't know. That some people estimate there's about two to 300 years that pass between these events in Genesis 50 and then the king who arose who didn't know Joseph. And in that time, whatever, two to three hundred years, the, the nation of Israel is outnumbering the nation of Egypt. And so what he says here in verse 20, 70 doesn't seem like a lot, but it's looking also towards, I think, the great nation promise. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he commanded them and, and, he, and he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. That is a model. So you've got the providence of God. Here's what you meant. Here's what God worked out. But you've also got, again, the, the idea of Romans chapter 12 and what, the Christ, what Christ, we as Christians are told in terms of, if it's possible, be at peace with people. <clears throat> Verses 22 to 26 talks about the death and embalming of Joseph. And, of course, he wants his bones taken out of Egypt, and that happens. He was 110 years old when he died, and they embalmed him and put him in a coffin in Egypt. Notice the promise there in verse 24. He says, I am dying. God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land. How, how long did God tell Abraham? All the way back in Genesis 15. You remember? That they were going to be there. Genesis 15 and verse 13. 400 years. So that's what we're getting ready to go into when we start the book of Exodus next week. I think we're going to do some Egyptian stuff next week first, kind of lay a historical setting, kind of get some picture, you know, a picture in our mind of, of what's going on in the world at that time. I think that's a good thing to do with your biblical books, get a, get a historical context as well. All right, anything else? No, it doesn't talk, no. All but Benjamin. Benjamin would always be the youngest, even if he lived to be older. Right? <laughs> Verse 20. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I kind of couple that thought with Psalm 37, 25. David said, I have been young and now I'm old. I've never seen his seed forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Yeah. Even in the worst of times, good can come out of it. Thanks, guys.